Okay. Let me know when it's, uh, is it recording yet or? I'm recording. Uh, it, I, last time I had some success recording, but the audio, audio levels are still a little bit um, of an okay. issue, but I'm trying to figure that out. All right. Let me actually try to recording. I'm not sure how much I have in terms of um, space. Let me see. Maybe I could free up some space in my um, Dropbox. Ben, do you have space in your Dropbox? not tried using the uh, the Jitsi recording method with the Dropbox. I assume that takes uh, probably too much bandwidth for me, but I'm, I've been testing using uh, open broadcast uh, software or studio, I guess that's what it's called, OBS. Um, that that worked last time, but the, there were some changes to the audio levels once I think my microphone switched on. It was like after that the other audio was quieter, so I'm trying to find uh, how to how to adjust that maybe. But it did it did record well, although the file size wasn't as small as I wanted. But it nothing wrong with it, other than the audio levels. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, let me see this again. Okay, so let's let's get started. I'm recording. Oh, stopped. Failed to start. Start a recording. Confirm. Recording has stopped. No, stopped. I'll try my regular route of vocal screen. Jen, are you able to hear or can you uh, record as backup? Okay, well, let's get started anyway. So let me share my screen here. Um, so welcome. We've got, what is today? February 19th. Uh, moving right along here. So today I want to actually introduce uh, a design sprint. I'd like to hold a sprint for the open source golf cart. Now that comes out of the blue somewhat. Uh, not totally. Shake this a little bit. Um, but it turns out... Uh, power cubes, hydraulics, uh, they actually make it very easy to do a golf cart. And actually, Katarina here asked me to do so for getting around the farm. And it could potentially be a good, a good, easy success. Now, when we started talking about it, so I have a document. If you look at the, um, so today's dev team meeting, see that in the chat. Uh, let me paste that in. Okay, there's the the document. No, is it? Well, it's in a click on the OS golf cart link, and right in the working document. And it'll take you to that. Now, uh, one of the things I've been talking about also is so I'm working on a book, uh, getting the 3D printer work business off the ground in terms of background funding. So kind of 
transitioning to the model of, of the workshops for 3D printers as a stable revenue model, trying to scale that. That's still in progress. Uh, we had a nice um, build last week at Highland Community College, planning some more for the future. Um, but one thing that came out, so if we talk about FIRST Robotics or OSC clubs, um, I do believe that a golf cart could be a, an interesting project. So I talked to Katerina about this. Um, so on one hand, we're doing the open source cordless drill challenge. That's on one side. But let's think about what a golf cart would do. I mean, that's a thing that people can drive, and, and driving is fascinating, kind of a, a vehicle of some sort. And if we make it an open source solar golf cart, that could be a compelling package that includes you got solar energy, you got uh, calculations of energy and power, you've got mobility, motors, um, we could make it hydraulic so that the the drive is hydraulic going to hydraulic motors, which are which is one low cost way to do it. So uh, an interesting concept. But let's go to the um, to the golf uh, presentation. And I want to go through that. And I do want to actually call for a design sprint this Saturday. Uh, sometime, uh, or rather, Friday or Saturday. Friday would work like, uh, let's say, you know, 1 p.m. or so. So we might want to try for day like Friday. Um, what I will do is uh, make an announcement. We do have a, a design sprints list of people who people have signed up. But if you want to start looking at this document here, uh, do take a look at that. So with the, the existing infrastructure of power cubes, uh, hydraulic motors, it actually makes it a low-hanging fruit kind of project because we're, you're not trying to optimize for some performance like torque or speed or anything. It's kind of like low low speed up to 20 miles per hour, which is a legal golf cart that uh, you don't have to have a license for. Uh, thinking about a 5 by 8 body, um, thinking about, let me, let me share my screen actually. Uh, We'll share the yeah so take a look at that on the screen if you want um power cube been working on a power cube for a long time uh, same power cube 16 horsepower um, body a body of the golf cart about five by eight feet uh easiest way to do it so so look at what golf carts are they, that's what they look like they're for moving around you could look in different different forms um, for us, if you look from the side, you've got option one, option two. Option two, uh, imagine uh, using something like box beam tubing, like on a tractor. Well, but that gets kind of heavy. You don't need that for a golf cart. So what if we use angle? But once again, use a frame that's similar to the construction of, of the 3D printer, the OSC D3D 3D printer. So basically an, a, a much larger frame, I would say quarter by four by four angle. But what that means is that you're making big panels, flat panels that are the six sides and then welding that into a cubic frame because that's the easiest way to work with angle to make a perfectly aligned frame uh, as we've been finding out. So easy way to do a frame, some wheels, power cube. Uh, power cube is 16 horsepower. Uh, dimensions, we're looking at different dimensions to kind of pick off dimensions from industry standards. So five foot seven inch height um, and so forth. So if you look at look at standard ways people do this, that's what you get. Um, up to like about 10 feet in length for the long versions of these things. Uh, just more industry standards, uh, dimensions. What does this thing look like? Tires. So you're know, looking at GrabCAD and other online sources for files and of tires in step format. Add to that some hydraulic motors and the power cube. And there you go. If you look at the hydraulic motors, 99 at surplus center for 5.4 cubic inches. This the second one here would be something that would be interesting to us. Gives us just about the right speed from between like uh, 14 to 28 miles per hour for this one um, that one there uh, four-wheel drive how about an all-terrain golf car uh, for those cost six hundred dollars that's doable once again the same kind of engine like we've been doing a little bit of calculations that say this will go at 27 miles per hour 
and so forth. So that's where we're at right now. But we'd like to see if we can keep evolving this to a, a full CAD drawing. So starting with a CAD like here, we've got some of the part libraries, wheels, a bench, like what do you do for the seat? Uh, do a simple bench um, and so forth. So that's, that's, um, that's what I've done um, for a little bit this weekend. Uh, but in the meantime, also working on a 3D printer and book and stuff. So, so that's my report. But I will announce this. Um, what's what's the timing look like for people? So, how about like can, can we do like 1 p.m. on Friday and then invite the greater community and see who shows up just with a few days, a few days of notice. Um, does Friday work for anybody here? Yeah, what, what time? Uh, let's say 1 p.m. on Friday. So we go for a couple of hours and see how far we get in that kind of time. But let's see if we can start uh, assembling that in three CADs. So basically work work up a, a part library of, of wheels, hydraulic motors, the, drawing out the frame in detail. Um, it's a basic structure, actually. So let's see, let's see where we get on that. OK, so I guess you have some documents you, you're showing already that you've drawn up yeah that gives yeah. some preparation point because yeah sometimes that that i guess is if people don't know what's um going on so i guess we're just going to start drawing parts right everybody pick a part and yeah draw some stuff right yeah yeah start coming up with a part library um whatever we can find online for admissible parts like tires and Hydraulic motors. We can borrow hydraulic motor. Uh, you know, we can borrow those stuff from the other, like Microtrack and other places. But they're not exactly the right thing. But we can, so we can start drawing up the more exact version of what's online if we can't find something similar. So based on who who shows up, divide the uh, create part libraries uh, for the golf cart. It's been a couple of uh, – I'll paste in the first. Slide here. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, this, this is something that, you know, with a few hours of good design, we can actually build this out pretty much readily as far as – on the on a power cube, what we can do is we talked about like anytime we build something, we might want to evolve the the design. And the, we mentioned about splitting the power cube into a hydraulic tank unit, basically hydraulics unit, and then an engine unit, so the engines could be easily swapped out for for fixing or repair. Because um, definitely, like the engine is going to be the thing that fails quickly. Um, on the micro track, just to report there that I couldn't fix uh, the pull cord. It's a pull cord start, pull start. It also has battery start. Now the pull cord just totally, I don't know, flaked out, doesn't roll back in. Try to open it up. It looks like the spring is broken or such. Uh, so now we can run it on, say, the battery, but I'd have to get replacement parts for the pull cord. But with that kind of stuff in mind, uh, it would be nice to have, have that engine module completely easily uh, take out a bull. Uh, so I think maybe in this time around, we might want to see if we can split the power cube into two units, one being the um, the hydraulic with multiple openings like we've done before, and then the second one just for the engine itself, which is like we did for the the one of the recent power cube versions, except that we would eliminate the cooler from that part because the cooler might be just on the hydraulic reservoir. Now, one, one additional thought about the cooler. Uh, now we use a dedicated cooler. What if we weld it on fins to our hydraulic power unit module? That's another way to go. That might be a decent route as well if we don't want a dedicated, uh, a dedicated hydraulic cooler. Now, of course, the hydraulic cooler is going to be more efficient, like, you know, for the space or, I don't know, it's, it's just probably going to do more heat rejection. But for a simple system, I think just welding on, like, say, 
either quarter by two or eighth inch by two fence to the whole surface of the reservoir, that wouldn't be a bad idea either. So we might want to try that. Uh, I guess we would have to look at some basic calculations of surface area and heat exchange with that because we know that a dedicated heat exchanger has a lot of surface area with the, all the broken out fins. But maybe we can get an idea of what the per, some calculations would be for just a basic fin exchanger. Just like an extruder for D3D, the printer, the tight and narrow extruder, it's got the uh, aluminum fins on the extruder part. Um, this would be welding steel fins to the hydraulic reservoir part. So adoption, uh, I know that some places around the world, you might have a hard time getting hydraulic coolers. Like, for example, a recent conversation with the Belize crew, they said that they make their own coolers because they're very expensive down in Belize. So the guy who's uh, stewarding our brick, brick press down there. Um, so, yeah, we, we can try that. But this would be good to move the power cube a little bit forward and see, like, the basic first implementation of vehicles for the overall Global Village construction set, going up to 20 miles per hour for road legal, no license required. Uh, you got to be, like, 16 years old to drive this uh, and so forth. Okay, so that's, um, that's on my side here. Um, also had... Just a couple, I uh, just started drawing up. Uh, I do want to go to one more thing on the, um, thinking about 3D printing of useful products. I've been doing some thinking about that and printing and, and rubber filaments because that's absolutely relevant for things like what if you want to print rubber tires for this puppy, this this little golf cart? Well, completely doable, uh, but you got to be effective at, at printing rubber. So I put up a document called the OSC 3D printer extruder. Now oh, I got to go to my drive. I didn't put the link in there. Um, but considerations for rubber printing. I actually noticed on a wiki that's that Eric, another Eric, not this Eric here, another Eric posted a, let's see what we got here. Posted a, an article on the, on a flexible filament extruder. Let me see here. Flexion extruder, it's called. I was like, wow. That's probably possibly better than the Titan Arrow, which is optimized for flexibles too. But it boils down to actually, like, I, I need to just test the, the speed of printing with flexible filaments here using the existing Titan Arrow. Uh, so if you take the take a look at the working document there, what I have on the screen, um, this is the insides of what a Titan Arrow looks like. So the thing I want to point to is this distance there. So, so the drive drive gear is there. Let me do a uh, so you're driving a filament down a throat so that you can push that filament. So the arrow is pointing to the drive gear. The filament goes like this. Like that. That's where the filament goes through. It's driven like that. But you see this neck area, be like after the drive gear. Um, so that's right, drive. So we got a drive gear, but there's a there's a long neck, there's this distance here, like all the way up to there before you enter the metal parts with the actual, the hot elements that melt the thing. So all that space between the drive and, uh, and, and the metal, 
parts. Oh, that's like that space. Not optimal for flexible filaments. That's the space where you can have where you're pushing a filament that can curl up on you, right? So if it's a very flexible filament, um, you can get into the details of what the hardness of rubber-like filaments is. But uh, if it's as soft as a rubber band, you might, you might kind of think, well, yeah, that you can push a rubber band down from the back into an aperture. Um, so there'll be limits. So we want to shorten up distance as much as possible. But you can see the an extruder there up in. Uh, so that's a contribution from Eric, not not Polliner, but another Eric on the wiki. Uh, the flexion has got closes up that gap, and I'm thinking it's like wow, mm, interesting. Let's we might want to design another extruder that's that's closing up that gap. I was thinking about using these gear down steppers because the thing is about this the tight and narrow. This big wheel is a gear down wheel from the stepper motor. Uh, stepper motor shaft is, let me label that right there. The stepper motor shaft is there. Stepper shaft. Where the shaft is. Uh, and it's driving this bigger gear for like a three or four, I don't know how much, five-fold gear down or so. Um, you need a gear down. So uh, if you want to simplify the extruder proper, use the use a gear down stepper motor. You can do that. Maybe we can use regular motors and planetary gear, 3D printed planetary gears as the gear down. Because you can print planetary gear downs pretty well using 3D printing. Uh, but anyway, just started thinking about what the optimal extruder would look like that can handle, first of all, three millimeter filaments because the flexion filament uh, extruder, the flexion 3D printer extruder, that's 1.75 millimeters. So once again, we're uh, off the shelf. The best ever you can get for flexible filaments is the Titan Arrow and this is what we're using because we want high industrial performance for all kinds of filaments. Um, but it's... I just noticed I don't like this part here, the distance between the drive and the metal and the flexion avoids that. So we might have to design our own, like where the drive is like right next to the metal. We'll see. But uh, given that the, the tight and narrow is hundred bucks, I don't know. We might have to start building our own. We'll see. Uh, definitely something for the longer term because uh, we want to optimize for for filaments that are flexible, like for printing wheels of of our golf cart. So that's just some considerations there. Uh, and thinking about what, whereas the standard filament goes up to three millimeters, like what about even fit, thicker filaments? So it's easier to push that through, or you can print larger objects. It's easier to talk about thicker filaments. It's easier to on the production side because if we talk about making our own filament using a filament maker like the Lyman filament maker, uh, it's easier to produce less of a fatter filament than more of a thinner one um, based on like tolerances. Because the fatter it is, the less accurate you have to be. Uh, so it's just a general idea. We, we might want to go into, we definitely want to do three millimeter, which is what we do now. Definitely not 1.75, which for flexibles, I mean, sorry, uh, that's not going to make it. Uh, for flexibles in general. I mean, you have to print really slow. So we want to go to three millimeter and possibly develop five millimeter as we go along. So that's a brief note on um, on the filament extruders um, for 3D printers with a tight and arrow that we are currently using. Okay, uh, I think I'll stop there on my side and let's. I'd like to hear more updates from other people. So maybe we can have, Nathan, maybe you can go um, can you report on what you've been up to? I'm not seeing anyone else that everyone's been having problems connecting it, it but my, my Jitsi really? user interface is really flaky and people keep popping in and out and so on. So I, I don't know, maybe we need mm -hmm. to do a, restart, but I think we might have lost uh, everyone else. I'm not sure that it looked like people were still oh. trying to reconnect and Jen was having audio issues. 
Oh, wow. Um, let's try what happens when we do a restart. But let's see. At that point, let me make sure I save this or stop the recording. No, actually, no, I'm not doing Gypsy. Okay, no, this can go. Okay. So let's, I'm just going to hit refresh. Okay. Yeah, well, I can just be you and I here. Um, continue with the R update. Okay. I uh, got that clamp for um, Don, and I guess you looked at it. I don't know, did you get a chance to uh, test print that at all? No, I did not. Okay. Um, let's talk about that a little bit so yeah so that's that's the final version we we do want to print yeah i can go right after this uh, i can just put it on uh and you've got the you emailed me the, the sdl file right so that's that's the yeah. one i want to use yeah I'll, I'll i'll just print it out right after the meeting it, um i mean you can see it has um uh, it had to be real close and thin in places to to get mm -hmm. to that 30 millimeter bolting possibility um, and I tried to no. fix some of the other the other shapes to try to make it print better, hopefully. But, um, mm. yeah, hopefully that's strong enough or prints well. I don't know what settings will be good for that, but I suppose it, it actually doesn't hopefully contain too much plastic there. In some ways, it's, it's pretty tight between all the holes and mm -hmm. everything, so it, it shouldn't use a lot of uh, plastic. But the thin points... I, they should be okay. I mean, the bolts will make it stronger, and uh, it's just a, a short bolt and a long bolt for the actual attachment. Uh, as far as the rest of the assembly, i got to keep going on that and check some of the other parts, but um, I was kind of reviewing mm -hmm. that and seeing how long that, just the process of that, because it, it takes a little while, took a little while to develop the clamp mainly and some of the other stuff that I was trying to get better with the uh, assembly being faster, but uh, so I've been looking at more at, at some of the Python and FreeCAD scripts and, and digging into that. It, it can be a little more complicated, but I found some good examples of uh, uh, scripts and macros that help me understand some of that better. And mostly it's just a matter of reading, you know, a lot of the, the Python uh, in, in FreeCAD, the methods and all that stuff that's in the, uh, uh, the kind of already referenced in the Python for FreeCAD uh, programming. I think it's... FreeCAD Programming 101, that kind of stuff. There's lots of good links there. And I've, I've found a few other links. Maybe I should add those to that page somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so different macros and examples of how to... Um, you have to generalize the macros. A lot of times the macros don't they'll work and they'll repeat something. But because the code is, is specific to uh, whatever you, you know, you're doing at the time, like it'll generalize to just the generic sketch names or uh, the uh, internal variables are, are uh, always some generic thing that it names in the code. And so to write a macro that's repeatable, you kind of have to go back and figure out how to uh, uh, write code in there to adjust the, the macro so that it's more universal and it's compatible with uh, anything that you might want to do make it repeatable but um mostly i also looked a lot of stuff to figure out assembly options for freecad but I, you know, I think i've talked about that before i still don't find anything better than um assembly the stuff might be better than assembly too but it has the same issues i think yeah. mostly so um it's kind of better to keep things with the standards we have i guess on that uh, maybe until till something gets finalized, and I don't know if that's going to happen when they finalize FreeCAD. Maybe not 0.17, maybe 0.18, who knows. So it's mm -hmm. hard to speculate on that, but the assembly does seem to take more time than some things. I mean, it's easy to draw parts, you know, for anybody to do that, but 
sometimes the collaborative issues in the assembly uh, that can be a little bit more difficult. But I, the ways we have set to do that, I think, work. Uh, if it just may take a little more time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, let's see, yeah, I guess we could. Uh, see, I see you have some working documents on that golf cart. It, is that we could talk about that more? The mm -hmm. uh, let's you said it's going to have uh, solar, I guess, on top. That's maybe for some batteries well, and so on. We're considering putting a PV panel because um, the the sixteen horsepower. Duramax has like one or two amps of charge, so it wouldn't be able to run a cooling fan. That's yeah. that's an issue. Yeah. And then we could have like a fan for electrical like lights and other stuff. Um, yeah. So a solar panel on top would be a decent idea. Because yeah. yeah. it's not to be um, really an ATV so much or more complicated to just keep it a simple golf cart. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Keep it a simple golf cart for now. Um, user friendly so so katarina can start it we are talking about uh adding electric start to that um oh. definitely electric start she'd like to have that um yeah. that would make it easier and i recall that electric start was a little more but then that also puts out uh let's see that version has more like a i don't know if it has an alternator but it has something where it puts out more power uh than the one without electric start right I'm not sure. There's there's two types. One is 16 horsepower. The other one is 18 horsepower. Oh. Um, both have this electric start option, but I think both of them have the crappy charging. Oh. All of them have this. It's like a two amp charger, so that wouldn't be enough to run a fan. Yeah. It could basically charge a battery uh, passively, I guess, just for starting. You need at least. Uh, but a, nothing more. A small sized uh, solar panel, and of course. A larger one, depending on the size of the vehicle, uh, right. just to cover, give, provide the roof. The, the roof. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yep. Let's see. Yep. Let's see. Just on, um, just to back up to, uh, is that 3D me PVC? Is that where you're putting the documents for the clamp and all that? Yes, the, the D3 Mini PVC, uh, yeah, the part library there. And let's see, there was a working document associated with that originally. Uh, oh, see, wow. that, I think that's linked there on that page somewhere. So let's see, I've got the frame. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. February is the last. Okay, so I'm just keeping track, making sure I can I, find all the files. I think that from what I've looked like on the assembly in general, it looks like the other parts and things will clear, but uh, sometimes there's been different arrangements. I know on the axes or, or um, the way that the extruders and different parts have mounted, but um, I think everything clears on this just by looking at it, but I'm going to add, of course, uh, I think a bunch more things to the uh, assembly, some of the smaller parts, the uh, end stops, and, and of course the extruder and stuff like that, just to see how stuff arranges better. Because um, mm -hmm. I know there's different, slightly different ways I think to do that. Uh, right. Depending on, um, yeah, how how it uses the the volume, I guess, best, or um, where some things might clear the frame. The frame having that diameter, uh, three quarter diameter like that, could cause issues at certain points. But um, yeah, I think the only issue is just. Any, any issues with the end stops would be uh, a bit of a problem, but there, there may be different ways to mount those too, so. Yeah, it gets us really close to a, you know, a construction set like that. If you think about students that schools could use, that would be, I think that would be pretty good. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of other little stuff, I guess, in the part library to catch up on, too. I haven't uh, detailed some of those um, too much. Some of those are, the, the parts already exist. I guess they need to be added. Um, and I think I think the length on the on the axis is fine. So just add, add the axis. It's the same. Um, 
see, I guess there's some parts that are not listed on that part library too, like, uh, well, the bat hold, well, oh no, the print, the, the print bolt, bat holder is listed there. Okay, so some of that stuff just needs to be added and cleaned up a little. Um, yeah, there's just more stuff to check on the assembly of that. And, hmm. I think it's pretty similar to mm -hmm. uh, the other printers, and I, I found some information so from the the manual on the uh, the printer uh, that was pretty useful. A better idea of the mm -hmm. assembly order, which I, will be a little different for uh, this probably in some ways, but I was trying to figure out what ways it might be different. There, there's going to be a little just. Probably assembly order complications because of the, the clamp and the way it goes together. Stuff might have to be bolted together in a different order. It's a little bit different, but... Yeah. Hmm. And I don't know how... Uh, let's see if... I don't know how PVC would compare to having to do anything differently with um, assembly versus the, uh, if it's printed PLA, if those parts get printed um, and so just using PVC, I'm not sure how that might affect um, the assembly. I guess the tolerances could vary. Somebody? But, what was that? You gotta be careful about just making sure that all the sides are the same length by axes and everything yeah. is straight so there's some um, consideration there mm -hmm. but yeah. if for example we we 3d print the actual tubing members then they can be pretty pretty exact right so that would be pretty good yeah recall because you're guaranteed fraction of a millimeter difference shrinkage and things on parts but as long as it's consistent um not familiar with the printing stuff yeah. that way yet but it should be close enough and sometimes you have to scrape the parts a little or something if they're not perfect but uh, yeah. the PVC isn't going to be exact either I think that the assembly mostly yeah it's going to be about keeping the, the frame square and things like that which requires some uh, thought to probably marking things and carefully putting it together uh, to keep the, the lengths exactly the same where the squareness yeah. of the frame matters mm -hmm. uh which seems to be a, some of that i noticed in the process for the other the mid printer in the manual i noticed a lot of stuff about keeping things even and, and the rod lengths and all that um so that most of that should be the same it's just um yeah a little more different squaring practices for the tubing frame yeah um and the idea that the PVC frame is lighter, so if we need stiffness on it, you can drill a hole in the top of the frame and fill it with concrete or like plaster of Paris or something to fill in the inside so it's a stiff, heavy frame. Because PVC is going to be light by itself. Yeah. So that's just another consideration. Yeah, the plastic be um, lighter. Yeah, I'm curious about the filling, if that's necessary. I think, well, I think John, so we haven't heard much in a while on, on uh John was doing the PVC printer, and I've seen other examples. People use PVC for printers, so it can't be um, uh, too lacking in stiffness. I, I suppose that mainly affects speed, which for a small printer, for a lot of people, is not really an issue. Uh, right. I assume that, that the speed, if you try to pick that up, then there might be more vibration. I, I, but for accuracy, right. I assume you just have to slow things down, and that's that makes it uh, yeah. go okay. But yeah, most people probably not too worried about speed, but um, yeah, having a metal frame, if it's more accurate and a little faster might be uh, always an advantage, but. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, I'm looking at, you know, on slide number seven, um, 
as far as the clamps going onto the frame, they also serve to reinforce the frame a little bit, so that's good. For a small printer, it might be just the perfect case. You, you know, you have a four, six by six inch print area and, and you don't really mind going too slow. Or you can just, as we said, just completely reinforce it. You can put um, a plate across one of the square sides, which will completely stiffen up a side. So there's different ways to go about that, and it'll be interesting to, I mean, it's really like you can fine tune and optimize that kind of a design. I, I would say to be pretty high performance, uh, as long as you have a high quality extruder, you know, depending on what you're looking for. But yeah, yeah, it's definitely uh, worth to play with and engineer around. Yeah, now, I hadn't thought about bracing that much, but I suppose people could try uh, yeah. different bracing options on it. Uh, you could probably just 3D print some braces and, and bolt them on, however, if you wanted to uh, test yeah. that. I mean, a brace, meaning like the way you can s completely solidify a four-sided uh, frame is by putting something, a plate, on that. That yeah. means you're preventing right. paralleling completely. So that completely stiffens that that side. Yeah, I could see the way yeah. issues there at... isn't um all, all of the stuff is is kind of uh parallel or perpendicular. So having a diagonal brace that that might solve some of the vibrational issues if that became an issue at a higher speed. So sometimes a diagonal uh across something really helps a lot on a cube like that. Uh, I'm looking at, is he having any luck there? Um, initial pr printing is starting, moved it to the indoors. Um, and I also asked John about high, high temperature pumps. One of the things I looked at is linear solar concentrator is that if you look at my log linear solar concentrator. Um, we're looking at can you actually get saturated water, which means water above 100 degrees Celsius through a simple solar concentrator uh, system. And we were looking at, OK, what about pumps? How do the pumps look? Let's see, I'm trying to click on this link. This taco pump. Okay, yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a heavy duty kind of a looking thing. Um, but I want to point out, going back to that, and then we'll, uh, yeah, let me go back to my log regarding solar concentrator because there's a um, I did some calculations on that DIY solar concentrators since that was yesterday so um, OSC France did a did a model back in I think it was like 2016 or 17 um, and there's a parabolic tubular collector from this Canada guy in this parabolic tube section right here. Um, he was using evacuated glass tubes, but looking into evacuated glass tubes, they're typically one end open, and we can probably find two ends open, but we need to find them, but not too easy. So I was looking at, okay, what happens when you do uh, solar concentration upon a black tube, just one inch black pipe? At one at one sun, it goes up to 90 degrees Celsius belt based on Boltzmann, Boltzmann's law of the sigma t to the fourth, the, the radiation from a black body. You end up with 90 degrees. But if you have three sun concentration, the max goes up to above 200 Celsius, which is good. So given that system like shown in the parabolic tube part here, uh, this is under DIY solar concentrator. Uh, if you look at that, that's like probably like 18 fold concentration. So yeah, we got plenty of temperature. So as long as we can pump that water, we can get saturated water, which means water above 100 degrees Celsius, which means it builds up pressure and, and, and contained in a thing like a propane tank at 18 atmospheres. That can be nighttime power storage. So that's, that's a mouthful there. But 
um, you have to understand saturated water, which means water above 100 degrees C. It's a competitor to batteries. So, so that's why I was looking at it. And the numbers actually look good that a simple, basic parabolic tube concentrator, parabolic with black pipe. So parabolic shapes behind, like something like reflective mylar or aluminum, uh, aluminized mylar or something like that. Uh, par parabolas with a bunch of one inch pipe could easily get you over 200 Celsius with 18 fold concentrations. So that's pretty good news. And I uh, just wanted to point that out that that's something to potentially, um, well, I mean, we're doing that in a global village construction set. So it's just providing the background theory that the numbers at least look good. And it's worth replicating with a guy in the parabolic tube length. Let me just click on that. Uh, um, this system here, uh, this is what he's doing, this kind of very simple system, all like troughs of, I think he's using, I think that surface there is aluminized mylar or something to that effect, be plain aluminum, but that's that's how that system looks and it can, can get you pretty decent temperatures. Um, so that's that's something to look at. Okay, but that's that's a side side report and some of the research I've been doing in the background. Um, in the meantime, here with John John's printer to see if he gets any decent results. I guess I would have to do some thinning. I I like to see what kind of quality he's getting uh, with his setup. But right now I can see. I mean, it looks particularly stable right now as it is. But he might if he goes slow, he'll get decent prints. Um, so he's doing some decent work there. Um, okay, so the clamp we're gonna print. Let's just take a look at Nathan's part light. I asked Nathan to do is put these things into a part library and that is good because now we see these basic elements that have the magnet holes where you do a sandwich. The background story to this is the link I sent to Nathan. What if the magnets, you have a double sandwich and put the magnets inside so that the you don't even have to uh, glue the magnets in, which is actually a good idea because they're kind of fin finicky about gluing in. So do double sandwiches with magnet holes and make those the plates that you use for your different uh, part library parts for the CD go home, home model. So we can uh, print that uh, go from there. Let's see what Nathan comment. Let's see how much. Yeah, he commented about that on his, his log. Hidden magnets. These are with the things look like snap to these together on sandwich um so that's good there now given that we've got no other people on this we might uh see what else do we want to cover on the golf cart what do you think about the idea of fins on a, on a hydraulic reservoir do you think that would be a good idea for a cooler Abe? Whoops, I, I had muted my microphone the other way. Um, yeah. it, it sounded like the, uh, the the fins and the cooling and all that before, uh, let's see, with just using the, the little bit of airflow of the engine, it sounded like the cooling wasn't necessarily um, that big of a deal. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I guess um, the experience with that is from, yeah, the, the previous power cubes a while back, and those all had a fairly large cooler, I think. I think yeah. the last one built was like 1708. Um, a, it was a different power cube. I'm trying to remember if that was for... Um, yeah. That was probably Not for the micro track um, 1710. Um, yeah. So it, it sounds also like there isn't a huge need, if I understand, for, for a lot of cooling, but there has to be I don't know how much that depends on ambient temperature. Probably ambient is less of an issue than just the how much the pump is is running. I guess right the the flow rate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, what I noticed is that above twelve horsepower, they always use coolers, and less than twelve, sometimes they don't use coolers, but. We know there's a lot of heat there. Yeah, in the winter, you probably don't have to have any cooling because it's cold enough. But in a 90-degree summer, you will need, you will need some. 
Yeah. And so it's not a big performance deal because I think we can do well with some strong fans and some fins. Uh, but the other part is cost because it would cost you like for eighth inch by two inch uh, steel plate, uh, steel bar. That's pretty inexpensive compared to a cooler, which is a hundred bucks plus the fittings. So that might be an advantage to have the cooling right on a tank. It would be a good idea, actually. Um, just occurred to me that for for cases where we don't need excessive cooling, like maybe not, maybe you won't get away with it for the 160 horsepower, but for 16 horsepower, yeah, absolutely. Uh, 16, 32, maybe 54. It's hmm. yeah, something um, that I can see. Uh, let's see, so you were saying so much bar. I think I think the plate that was planned for the, or that's been used for the tanks before was maybe like almost a quarter inch thick. So for adding fins to the tank or to uh, try to just make some other cooling apparatus that way, I guess if you used sections of pipe, um, I don't know how, the cost of hard steel pipe and, and using that um, to connect some things and then putting some cooling off of that, kind of making your own cooler a little yeah. bit if necessary. That, that, but that has a lot of complexity. I assume welding some thin sheet metal for fins onto things is um, that that's just a bunch of tack welding that that could add a lot of welding but uh, yeah, that's probably less of an issue I guess um, and sheet metal I guess isn't hard to cut by hand or or if you have a torch table it's pretty easy to do to do fins or something just strips of uh, thin sheet yeah. right? yeah um so i upload i'm uploading your updated clamp to the wiki there because you, you didn't have it on the wiki but take a look at this quite attractive oh um, did i not push the last version of the, i thought i got i just i just did it right now but look at okay. this that looks pretty pretty exotic yeah and this is looks... what you have this top one is what you got on the wiki so yeah oh i uh huh. That's that was still there, but yeah, I mean that's what's down here. Let's do it. I'll uh, set it up right now. So, yeah, yeah, it could work. I mean, it's pretty thin on this section, so well, it's pretty fat here. This is a case where. Oh yeah. Is it pretty good at dynamically um, yeah. printing the? Let's see, they call it wall and and then infill. I don't know how dynamic uh, the software is about figuring out what to print uh, with more or less. Oh, yeah, info. actually, yeah, what we could do here, actually, in this production engineering would be, like, make a fat wall and very low infill. So yeah. here, where it has the thin part, it'll be, like, 100%, but in this fat part, it'll be, like, the lower percent. But, yeah, I'll just print it regular for now, see how it, yeah. no yeah. messing around, just, yeah, like, here you got shell thickness. Yeah, that would be, you might want to make it like 0 0.8. That's 0 0.8 millimeter. Make it like 2.4 millimeters or something, and then some of these parts that are needed to be strong would be pretty solid. Yeah, um, that one part. Well, actually, all the parts where it's thin, where the bolt goes through, and especially at that nut recess, it was so thin. I was kind of concerned how um, well a a large if the extrusion uh, is diameter is pretty high. Uh, I wasn't sure how well that would print, or if it would get you know enough layers uh, to be strong. Yeah. Uh, but I get you, you can set, I guess, all that, all the the uh, not the filament diameter, but the actual um, extrusion uh, thickness, right? Um. Well, I mean, we've got or the point four millimeter filament coming out. Yeah, that'll be yeah. fine. I'll be just uh, okay. I'll see what it looks like with twenty percent. I guess it and, depends on nozzle and uh, flow rate. And yeah, I, I, I I'll, I'll make the shell thickness pretty thick, like two point four. Yeah, instead of point eight. I assume you're using and more the the larger volcano nozzles and stuff like that, but I um, for uh, more rapid production printing, but. Uh, I assume it can kind of vary that. 
depending on speed. No, I'm not doing the volcano on this one. We're not really getting no. into volcano so much yet, just a regular okay. one. But yeah, so I'll try printing this and see how it goes. Uh, I'll do that like right now and I'll announce the, I'll make a call out for the, the Friday 1 p.m. on the design sprint on the open source golf cart run by a power cube and then a, later a solar power cube. Right now we'll keep it simple with regular uh, functional stuff, but, but you can make the solar, which would be a good challenge for um, student projects or something. So Yeah, I suppose on this yeah. golf cart, um, I guess it would be good to set up, I think I'll set up the, I'll try to set up the wiki page here a little better, maybe add a part library to yeah. that page. That'll yeah, please. Um, help organize stuff because sometimes people, uh, uh, some of the issues sometimes with design yeah. sprints is the confusion of what uh, to do ahead of time when you know, a certain amount of preparation helps. So I'll do that. And I suppose yeah. the, the main yeah, issue is the, part uh -huh. the See, there's a lot of, I guess, frame. Uh, I mean, this thing needs to be pretty light. Obviously, you don't want to use a lot of heavy hmm, steel, um, <laughs> like a tractor or something like that, obviously. So, so it'd be helpful to do a lot of, um, you know, quarter-inch sheet metal and, and cut parts like that, right? Uh, it's going to have to be... That's correct. Uh, there's going to have to be a lot of yeah, cutting. Yeah. What I'm thinking is, yeah, quarter-inch, quarter, quarter inch, so basically... Uh, essentially a frame like the D3D and a power cube, uh, six flat plates, and they're going to be quarter by four for the thickness of the web. Uh, so it'll be effectively quarter by four angle. And I think that'll be plenty strong for and light enough still. So calculations on weight of that hmm. would be in order. Yeah, different we design for, um, hmm. yeah, the arrangement, because the tank, the tank always needs to be above. So maybe the tank behind the seat or well i see some of these golf carts they have like multiple seats depending on the size here maybe there's a forward and rear facing seat uh maybe you could have the tank between yeah. but the engine uh you have to fit the engine underneath the the main seating area and i guess rear rear wheel drive is well yeah that that's kind of easier isn't it i suppose um well, I wanted to do a, what I'd like to do is four wheel drive skid steering golf cart. So it's absolutely uh -huh. ridiculously easy. No technology. This is like a uh, ridiculously simple version one project. Hmm. Okay. So four wheel drive. So, so that's hoses. Yeah. yeah. Because we'll need that too. Like if we ever go off into the woods, I mean, we'll need that. Yeah. It makes Definitely. it nicer. So probably a larger, uh, a larger golf cart. ATV design then, I mean, to, well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, page one says five feet by eight feet long. And 16 horse yeah. is probably a lot of power for uh, one of these anyway. I mean, golf carts are usually just simple electric uh, yeah. motors, so yep. they're not, probably not that many horsepower, so. Hmm. Yeah, this should, this should be good. Like, basically, no problem in terms of the engineering. Yeah, and I guess it, well, let's see, yeah, if the cube is separated, hmm, yeah, it could kind of make it, depending on how it's arranged, um, could be a mobile power source as well, I guess, that way, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's kind of handy. Uh, another farm feature. I, I, I could think of, like, an ATV with um, even the possibility of a power takeoff, but that that's something a little bit uh, larger and yeah, heavier, and more more power. But but with the golf yeah, cart, either way, it's it's mobile, and so you've got you've got hydraulics you can hook to something. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think it'll be pretty quick to uh, re-edit the power cubes. To think about that again, I suppose for the golf cart. The issues it may it may need to be hmm, the the shape may need to be really different um, or just but definitely separating the uh, the engine and the tank and the the uh, kind of redoing the power cubes that way uh, without the engine just having the tank separate and the cooling 
with the tank, I guess. Yep, separate tank power cube and separate engine so that the engines are super swappable. Um, yeah. Because they, they've been, like, unless we start making our own, like, and I, I think I mentioned the Changpa diesel, and we got to build up our precision machining infrastructure, which is not there yet. Um, yeah, we, but we will have that. That's in the next eight years, time's ticking, 2028, uh, yeah, next nine years, almost that, a decade. But we got to get all that in place. Precision CNC. Uh, milling that that's a whole uh, yeah a whole nother uh, yeah, thing. A whole so, other ball wax we haven't touched yeah. that much but yeah that's in the um, yeah. I, I think a lot can be done well that's one thing that make some of this stuff easier um, I suppose you haven't looked at the the torch table in a while um, no I haven't but the, the the just the general rollout is finishing off the 3d printer so right now I'm into the just like some little upgrades, like one of the upgrades, as you mentioned, the volcano. Well, we haven't been using the volcano, so I'm, oh. I'm adding that, um, just freezing that version as a basic version. And then I got to move on to the torch table. Yeah. Um, okay. that's, that's the way it's got to go because okay. we got to have the steel cutting ability in house, and hopefully, with that, produce the oxy hydrogen cutting, which mm -hmm. I'll start with oxy acetylene, but oxy hydrogen would be really good because that can also cut aluminum and copper oh. so yeah. anyway um we're not there yet on that so for now we'll just do simple in the stone age just well but for the frame actually it's convenient to use quarter by four flats because they're cheap accessible and we can weld them into the very large frame just like i did the large frame of the one cubic meter 3d printer from a quarter by half flats. Here we'll use quarter by four flats to make a huge frame out of six sides. Yeah. yeah um, I, I figure even without the torch table, cutting that quarter inch uh, by hand, if necessary, you can lay that out pretty easily. And uh, even if yeah. the, there's some shapes that are a little bit complex, most of the stuff is rough enough that. Um, you can do it by hand and then weld it, uh, you know, together yep. pretty well. Okay. Hey, so let's let's finish here. I got to get rolling. Um, so I'll I'll send out the announcement to the design sprints list. Are you on that list? Email list. Design sprint. I think so. Uh, I should be yeah, on the email you probably list. are there. Um, but yeah, so I'll do that and announce that and we'll do we'll get some more progress on doing all the design work including weight calculations and hopefully a lot of the free get free cat part libraries so we can uh, start showing how it actually looks yeah 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 i'm working on that part library on the golf cart thing so uh excellent so yeah so we'll see you then on friday so thanks everybody and whoever's watching this and um continue with our next design sprint on friday and otherwise the regular meeting next Tuesday at the same time, 2 p.m. CST USA time. Thanks right. a lot. Have a good See day. See you Friday at 1. Yep. Bye-bye. Yeah.